Good day viewers and welcome to today's class. Today we shall be discussing an history of white English language paper two questions. That is an history in quotes of white English language paper two questions. I shall be doing this video as a response to one of the questions that is coming from my previous videos and the question reads, Bravo sir, please can you explain in detailed form on how to answer questions on synonyms and antonyms? So that's the question and uh, in response to this question, I shall be explaining not only how to answer questions on synonyms and antonyms, but how to answer questions on all the aspects of English language paper 2. So that is what we shall be doing in this class today. Now, English language paper 2 has six sections that are tested on different aspects of English. These are the six different forms of questions that we expect to see in English language paper 2. Alright? Now, section 1, most nearly opposite, basically deals with antonyms. And then you have section 2, best complete. This aspect deals with collocations. Then section 3 is most appropriate interpretations. This aspect deals with idioms. And then you have section four, nearest in meaning. This aspect deals with what? With uh, synonyms. And then you have section five, best complete. This aspect deals with grammar. And then section six, you have most suitable to fill in the gap and so on. And this aspect deals with register. Now, in ordinary explanation, we can say that Section 1 deals with antonyms, antonyms, then section 2 deals with what? Collocations, collocations, then section, this is section 2, section 1, and then section 3 deals with idioms, section 3 deals with idioms, Section 4, section 4 deals with synonyms, synonyms, then section 5, section 5 deals with grammar, section 5 deals with grammar, and then section 6, section 6 deals with registers, registers. So these are the six aspects that are tested on English. So in our discussion today, we want to start taking one after the other and then explaining very clearly how to handle questions on each of these sections. Section one. Most nearly opposite in meaning. Most nearly opposite. Most nearly opposite in meaning. Most nearly opposite in meaning. Which, as we said at the beginning, simply has to do with antonyms. So this aspect of the paper is a test of words and their most nearly opposite words. That is why you have to be very careful with nearly opposite, so that the word you are going to be considering as the correct option may not be the exact opposite of the one that is underlined. A word is going to be what? Underlined in the context, and then you are now going to be what? Asked to pick an option that is nearly opposite to the one that is underlined. So it may not be the exact opposite. Let's get that straight. That said, what are the rules that we can use to handle questions on section one, which is what? Nearly opposite meanings. So, I give you the rules. The summary of 
the rules that we use for asking questions in this section of the paper is elimination, elimination slash context selection. And how do we use this tool? Before you begin, the first thing you do, that is, we can say step one, step one. Try to understand the context, try to understand the question. Ignore the option, first of all. That is, don't start by looking at the options, but the question. Step one, try to understand the context of the question. Context of what? Of the question. That's what the question is saying. Alright? Now, step two. Look through the option and try to eliminate any word that sounds like a synonym of the underlying word. So when you can check A, B, C, D, E, or whatever, if they are talking about it, usually, usually what D, they stop at D. So you check which of the words given there is a synonym of the underlined word in the question. The reason you are eliminating synonym is because you are treating antonym. So, since you are looking for a word that is an antonym, that is a corresponding, an antonym of the word that is on the line of the question, you don't need a word that is a synonym to be present. A word that is a synonym is going to, I mean, negate your answer. Okay? So that is why the next step is to eliminate a word that sounds like a synonym. Then you go over toward step three. With step three, what do you now do? Eliminate an option that appears to be absurd in relation to the context. In relation, in relation to the context. In relation to the context. In relation to the context. Then step four, finally. After carrying out step two and three, you would have been able to eliminate one or two options, leaving you with what? Two or three options to select from. So you now select based on contextual meaning. So you now use contextual analysis to pick your final question. Use contextual analysis contextual analysis to pick your final option, to pick Now, here is an example of how to use the rules Why? Question 1, 2012 Although the atmosphere was hostile the meeting ended on dash terms. A. Gentle. B. Unacceptable. C. Suspicious. D. Amicable. Now, the word that we are considering is what? Hostile. It's a very common word. Hostile means for something to be harsh, to be unfriendly, to be unfavorable, to be unpredictable. So, when hostile is used, inside an expression or in a part of your clause and you see although in that expression this is an adverb of concession whenever although is used in an expression either as an adverb or as an adjective it simply tells you that the two ideas that are expressed in that sentence are not going in the same direction they are negating each other so if atmosphere is hostile then the second part of this expression must be a good word, not a negative word. So that is understanding the context. You move over to step two. Look through the option and try to eliminate any word that sounds like synonym of the other line. Now remember the word we are considering is a negative word. If you like, you can say bad word. So any good word here will stand so that any bad word should go. Look through the options and try to eliminate any word that sounds like a synonym. So, the word that looks like meaning the same thing with the other line should go away. Gentle. It's not meaning the same thing with the other line because hostile is harsh. Gentle is on the good side. It's a good word. So, you leave gentle alone. Unacceptable. If you say something unacceptable, that means it's unwanted. That means it's, uh, 
shouldn't be entertained. So, unacceptable is bad. Something bad is a bad word. Hostile is bad. So, just eliminate what? Unacceptable. Then you have suspicious. Suspicious. When you say something suspicious, it's a, it's a lot of very common words. Some of the words that come under Antonym and Synonym, some of them are common. They are common words, okay? Yes, but how to apply them, how to use them, how to select them and appropriate them in the question that we bring is the problem. So now we have suspicion. Say something is suspicious, that is, something is fishy, something is not right. It's a negative word too. Hosta is negative, so suspicious has to go. Then you come over to amicable. Let's say we don't know the meaning of amicable. I will grant you the benefit of doubt over this amicable. Let's just leave that and assume you don't know the meaning. Or you say we don't know the meaning in the exam condition. Okay? So, when you say I'm making, okay, I don't know the number I'm making for right now. So, but then two options are gone. That B and C are gone. Left there and D. Now, so, now take from what you know to what you don't know. That is, eliminate an option that appears to be absurd. That is step three now. Eliminate an option that appears to be absurd in relation towards the context. So, which one is going to go? We are left with only two now. Sometimes you can be left with three. Maybe when you took the first step, it was only one option that left. So now you say, gentle. Although the atmosphere was coaster, the meeting ended on gentle terms. Gentle, is it like gentle terms? You don't ask yourself, gentle terms. How can terms be gentle? Okay. You don't go over to step four and say, use contextual analysis. Which words would fit best into the context? The meeting ended on amicable terms. You can't some challenges like, what would it take gentle terms, amicable terms? If you think very well, you will understand that gentle terms looks too casual. It doesn't fit into this context. Can you say gentle terms? No. So the best way that we apply here is amicable terms, not gentle terms. Not because gentle is not uh, tempting. But because we don't feel it is appropriate in the context, or we don't feel it is the, the best words that should go in there. We don't think it is better than amicable to go into that gap. For us to say gentle, though we don't know the meaning of amicable, we know that gentle is just too casual, too weak, or too ordinary. So this is how to use this uh, principle. And at the end of the day, you will arrive at your answer quite confidently. Now let's go over to the next one. I want to do something, okay? We are done with this now. I want to move over to section 4. I want to skip section 2 and section 3 and go over to section 4 because there is something common about uh, uh, section 1 and section 2. So they have the common ground. That said, Although the white people, okay, they bring them as section one, section two, they, they make the first one to be section one, the other one section four. I don't know why. Left to me, I, if I were to advise the examining body, I said, okay, after considering section one as most of nearly your position, just put section two as nearly uh, uh, nearest to me, so that you can just work together. But uh, for, fortunately, or oh, fortunately, they separated the section. But for the purpose of this uh, video, okay, I want us to just skip the two and move over to the fourth one, that's section four, nearest in meaning. That said, section one and section four require the same rules. That's antonym and synonym require the same rules, but with a little exception, all right? And what is that? That is, when you are working on nearest in meaning, that is synonym, Okay, I think we can strike this one now, we can mark this, and then we are on this now. Right, so when you are talking about synonyms, you will still use elimination slash context selection. But what you are going to do, there will be a little difference somewhere, which I will explain when we get there. And that difference normally affects the aspect of elimination. So step one, try to understand the context of the question, like we explained earlier on. Then step two, Look through the options and try to eliminate any words that sounds like a synonym of the underlined word. This is where the difference will come into play. Now, 
we are considering what synonym that is nearest meaning. So we are not going to strike out a synonym. Rather, we will strike out an antony. So this is the difference in what in the rule we strike out an antony. So we cannot read this rule like this. Look through the options and try to eliminate any word that sounds like an antonym of the underlined word. Simple. That's just it. That's how it works. When you are considering, just take it this way. When you are considering antonym, look through the options, strike out synonym. When you are considering synonym, synonyms, look through the options and strike out what? Antonym. So that's just it. And this is the only difference between the two operations. Then step three, we just continue in the normal way, like eliminate an option that appears to be absorbed in relation to the context. Now let's have an example. Let's have an example. The same way 2012, question 33. Per battery augmented its income by selling firewood. Yes, what we are working on here is augmented. Augmented. So take step one, try to understand the context of the question, the context, the meaning of the question. Per bakery, this is somebody, you want to hear pa, it's like someone. Augmented is income. What is income? Money that comes into his hands, all right? Now, augmented it by selling fire. Why you don't know the meaning of augmented? By selling firewood. That's something that would quickly come to your understanding. This is uh, something like, this man is trying to make extra income. That is, by selling firewood, augmented. Is it called by selling firewood or so like making a strike income? That's what it should suggest to us very quickly. So you go over to step two. Look through the options and try to eliminate any word that sounds like an antonym. Okay? And then there's an antonym to the other line. Then strike it off. A. Papa Green augmented his income by what? Selling firewood. Saved his income. Saved his income. Like we said, augmented. Is it like this? Is augmented destroying his income or is helping his income? Augmented is helping his income. Okay, can you, can you replace augmented with help? Babakari helped his income by selling firewood. If there's anything like that. So you can see that saying is going in the same direction with what? Augmented. As if you are considering synonym, leave it alone. It's antonym word that go. Babakari augmented his income. Okay, now we try to preserve. Preserve is either getting or positive. Preserve to preserve to save. That is to save, to save somebody or to save something. Alright, so it's positive word as well. It's going in line with augmented. And we're looking for synonyms. So all words that are going in line will be suspected. Increase this word, income. For Bakery, increase, fine. Increase is income. Economize. Those uh, for Bakery, economize income. You economize by spending. Okay, but somebody is now economizing his income by selling firewood. No, so economize will not go. Not necessarily because it is an antonym to the other word, to the underlying word, but because it doesn't fit into the context. I think that has automatically taken us into the third leg of the word, the rule. So we can say that uh, step two and three are on elimination, while step four is on selection. But this of these, uh, step three is uh, between what? Elimination and selection. But when you get to step three, you are already into selection indirectly. So now, eliminate the option that appears to be what? Absorbed in relation to the context, like we have just removed from the minds. So, step three, eliminate an option that appears to be absorbed in relation to the context. Saved. Papakari saved. Is income by selling firewood. You may be tempted to take that, just leave it alone. But what can you preserve? Do you preserve it? To preserve is like to maintain, to keep something from getting what damaged. So we don't prevent, we don't prevent income from getting damaged. So B will not fit into that context. Now we are left with what? A and C. Save this income, increase this income. Now, this is where we go. Use context analysis to pick your final answer. Save this income. Increase this income by selling firewood. When you sell firewood, are you saving your income or you are increasing your income? Friends, it is increasing income. So when you are making some money, and you are not trying to be selling firewood again, you are not saving the one you are making, but you are increasing your income. That is what is coming into your hand. 
So at the end of the day, you have what? C as the correct answer. So that is how to use this principle to handle synonyms as well. Now we'll move over to the next part, which is the section that we skipped before, section two, talking about best complete. Best complete. Now we are talking about best complete. This section, that is section two of the English language paper two, is a different ball game. What we mean is that it doesn't have uh, much to do with section one and four. That is actually a synonym. Okay? Now we're talking about best complete. The instruction you normally see the best complete is repeated twice. So you normally find it under two headings. This instruction normally comes twice. Okay, it comes under section two and then it comes under section what? Five. So let's look at it. When it comes under section two, it is coming as collocation. But when it comes under section five, it's coming as grammar. So I'm looking into that. So next. Now, in English, the idea is a follow-up with the idea of what? Of uh, synonyms. You know, synonyms is a situation whereby you have one word, or two or more words that are similar in meanings. But mind you, those words, no matter how many they are, okay, that are having uh, similar meanings, they cannot fit into the same expression at the same time. They fit into different expressions differently. So this is what we are talking about here. Now, with that short explanation, let's move forward to how to treat this section of the paper. When questions come on best complete, what are the rules? What can you do? You still work with uh, elimination, okay? Elimination, elimination slash what? Context selection. Now let's look at, a, at an example and see how it works. Now we have an example. Why 2012 question 17? The river dashed across the plain. A. Road. B. Meandered. C. Trickled. D. Passed. This is talking about best complete. So choose an option that best complete. Use the steps. We said look through the options and eliminate a word that looks too ordinary or too casual, all right? Too ordinary or too casual to fill the blank space provided. The river rolled. <laughs> how, can you, how can the river roll? The river doesn't have to roll, so you strike off A. The river meandered. Oh, man, I don't understand the meaning of meandered. So just leave that one. What about the river trickled? Trickled. You really may not understand the meaning of trickled ordinarily here, but you can just leave it too. D. Passed. How can a river pass? Can a river pass? You can only pass with legs, and now a river does not have legs. So a river cannot be passing across the plain. It's only a human being that can pass, or maybe an animal or something like that. Or so a car too can pass because those things or stuff have what? Legs. So now, with that, we are gone with what? A and what? D. So we now have B and C left. So now, go to step two, that is context selection. Think from what you know to what you don't know. Think from what you know to what you don't know. Now, I know the meaning, I don't know the meaning of meander, for example. That is the left to be and say, but trickled, trickled, that does not trickled. You also may find it difficult to know the meaning of trickled. Now, I can give you the idea of uh, using onomatopoeia to understand words. Chico, the way chico is used, even if you have not heard of that word before, chico, chico means like for something to pour in, right? So, can a river pour in across the plain? No. So, I will just remove chico from that understanding, from the sound of the word. Sometimes, when you are under serious examination or tension, you can use anything to arrive at answer. So, chico, river doesn't have to chico. You can use onomatopoeia, that is, on the is using sound to know meanings, how sound relates to meaning in English, and that's essentially in literature. So, a river doesn't have to chico across, but you say a river chico across, a river meandered across. So, since I know that chico shouldn't go into the solution, thinking from what you know to what you don't know, I will take what? B. And automatically, a river meanders. That is the word we use to describe the movement of a river. Good. 
So we move forward to section 3, which is most appropriate interpretation. This is another very interesting section. And like uh, we subtitled it below, we tagged it idioms. Most appropriate interpretation is what? Idioms. Now, what do you do here? That is when you are faced with section 3 of English language paper 2. Most appropriate interpretation. The instruction comes as most appropriate interpretation. But it is essentially giving the meaning or the interpretation of a, of a group of words. That is an expression this time around. Some of the expressions that we are going to be giving to interpret are uh, literary, that is, they are not ordinary expressions. And though some of them can be literal, that is ordinary, and you still be asked to give their interpretation. Alright, so now, how do you handle problems on idioms? We just go straight to the rules. Number one, idioms are coded expressions, they don't have ordinary interpretations. So their meanings cannot be what. Uh, cannot be indicated in the surface of the words of the idiom. So that said, the first step is look through, let the options alone, read through the word, the question, and try to understand the words that are contained in the idiom and what they are pointed to. Then step two, step two, then the next one is step three. Taking these steps, that is like after taking step two and step three, it will be possible for you to eliminate one or two options, and then you will be left with what two or three to select your answer from. And then step what four now is for you to go by context. Okay. This is how to go about answering questions on idioms. Now let's have an example, okay, of how these rules work. Why 2012 question 28? William spent the first three months learning the ropes. This means that A, you put all the ropes that should be pulled. B, you learned what the job demanded. C, you knew what to do. D, you was unwilling to learn. Good, let's go over our rules. The first one is to read through the question and try to understand what it is saying. William spent the first three months learning the ropes. This is like somebody comes into a job and the person is spending the first three months learning some, learning a rope. Learning, how was it of learning rope now in a job? Okay, no problem. So, two, eliminate any option that sounds like an ordinary interpretation. A says what? He pulled all the ropes that should be pulled. There's a problem with that option because if you read the three, it says eliminate any option that repeats a word of the idiom. It sounds, this uh, option is committed to offenses here. Number one, it sounds like another interpretation. Number two, it is repeating a word of the idiom. So eliminate option word A. Now you are left with this C and D. This is he learned what the job demanded. Leave that alone because it's making sense to us, but you can't conclude until you are done with the question. C says he knew what to do. Remember, it says eliminate any option that sounds like an opposite interpretation. If he spent the first time on learning the rope, does that mean that this guy already what, knew what to do? No. He doesn't know what to do. So you are going to strike out C. If he knew what to do, then he wouldn't be spending the first three months learning anything. So, C so can go based on step four. Then you are not left to put B and D. This is learning what the job demanded, and this is was unwilling to learn. Step four again is going to give us a final answer. Like, he learned what the job demanded, I said we should leave that alone. Why not was unwilling to learn? It's opposite. They said somebody spent first three more learning, but this one says unwilling to learn. No. So D cannot go. Automatically, you have B as the correct answer. So that is that about how to treat problems on uh, most uh, appropriate interpretation, that is, on idioms. So you now go over to the fifth word uh, section of the paper, which is best complaint again. Now I mentioned that at the beginning that best complaint comes as 
an instruction on two different sections in the examination, that is a school location and then also in section five. But in section five, it is asking questions on grammar, on the rules of what? Grammar. So how do we handle this aspect of the paper? Section five, grammar. This aspect of the examination, as far as I can say, is the most dicey aspect of white English paper two. The reason is very simple and short. When you look through all these other sections, one, two, three, and four, Beside the fact that they have only 10 questions each containing them, section 5 has 30 questions. That's from question 41. I think we should, we can straight that. This is usually question 1 to 10. And then this is question what? 11 to what? 20. And this one is question 21 to what? 30. And this one is question 31 to what? 40. But this one is question 41 to question 70. So, grammar is tested in work under section 5 in 30 questions. But that's not what really makes uh, uh, this aspect of English very tough or somehow funny or tricky. What makes it funny is because of the numerous topics that can be lined up under this section. Unlike most of the really meaning, these ones are just straightforward, and all the rules we are considering, they are straightforward. That once we spell out uh, a given set of rules, we can apply it to all the questions that come under each of the section. But here it doesn't work like that. So that's one basic thing I want you to take home from this video. It doesn't work like that here. Because number one, you cannot predict the topics that questions are going to be drawn from. And then number two, you have a responsibility to what? To know the topic and then also to what? To, to know the principle of going about selecting your answer under that. So I think that is what we need to say here. So the rules here, how do you answer questions on what? On grammar. Step one, identify the question. Identify the question. Identify the word, the topic. Identify the topic that the question is coming from. Identify the topic that the question is what? Coming from. That's the one. Coming from. Identify the topic that the question is what? Coming from. That's that. Then what about step two? Other grammar. After identifying the topic that the question is coming from, then you try to apply the principle that governs that topic. That governs that topic. So it is as short as that. Number one, identify the topic that the question is coming from, and then number two, try to apply the principle that governs that topic. That's all. It's as simple as that. So when you want to face this aspect of why English paper 2, you quickly have to run your mind through all the possible topics that can what? Come up in what? In, uh, in this section. Don't forget all the topics. There are all the topics on grammar. They usually start from parts of speech, Parts of what? Speech, part of speech, then the noun, the verb, and all of that. Then you have uh, sentence, uh, the sentence, then you have the idea of phrase, and the idea of what? Clause, and then you have the idea of what? Uh, types of questions, types of questions, type of questions, polar questions. Polar words questions, polar questions, that is yes or no question, yes or no questions, and then you have tag questions, tag questions, then you can have uh, conditionals, conditionals, then you can have subjectives. So this is a summary of some of the questions that you have.
part of speech, the noun, the pronoun, the adjective, the conjunction, the preposition, and how to use all of them. It's very wide. I will refer you to uh, I think uh, one of my videos that talk about the five aspects of English. The five aspects aspects of grammar. Okay, I have a video on that. The five aspects of grammar. The five aspects of grammar can help you to have an overview of what happens under grammar. I mean, another part of speech in grammar. Then you learn about sentence, phrase, clause, and how to make agreement. Oh wow, we must have uh, things like what? Concord, of course. So you have types of questions, polar questions, tag questions, conditionals, subjectives. Uh, you have uh, subjectives, and then you have concord, and so on and so forth. So these are things that you should have at the back of your mind when approaching this section of the exam. So go over to the last section, which is most suitable. Most suitable. This section of the exam tests student understanding of uh, registers. Registers. That is, word patterns. Words that are used in uh, different walks of life, okay? Different areas and different jobs in life. Like, talk about uh, words commonly used, words commonly used in, uh, you can have uh, commerce, words commonly used in commerce, then words commonly used in agriculture, Agriculture, where is commonly used in science and tech, science and tech, where is commonly used in medicine, medicine, where is commonly used in engineering, engineering, then uh, where is commonly used in what, Jewish slash uh, judiciary, where is commonly used in uh, marketing, okay, we already have market or uh, commerce there, I said commerce to what, marketing. Then uh, marketing, then uh, where is commonly used in banking, where is commonly used in what? Transit, stroke what? Transport, different forms of what? Transport, where is commonly used in religion, where is commonly used in religion, where is commonly used in education, education, where is commonly used in what? Politics. They are so what many. So you have to have an idea of all these words to be able to approach section six. So this is how to explain the all the sections that come under white English paper two.